Good afternoon and welcome to this very special live panel session today brought to you by the VLGA and LG Pro. For the first time, our two organisations are collaborating on a session that is of equal relevance to elected representatives as well as professionals in the sector. The caretaker conventions and what your council needs to know as we move into election period next week. So firstly, can I please acknowledge the traditional owners of country from right across Victoria and beyond. In fact, from wherever you are joining us today, we acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging and the connection to those lands. And we're very, very pleased to have so many of you with us this afternoon, one of our uh, stronger um, attendances at, uh, at a live panel session. Can I firstly introduce to you Catherine Arndt, who is the CEO of the VLGA, to do a quick welcome on behalf of the VLGA. Good afternoon, Catherine. Good afternoon, Chris, and thank you for that uh, introduction. And on behalf of the VLGA, I would like to welcome all of you to today's panel discussion on caretaker conventions as we find ourselves heading into local government elections in what could only be described as unprecedented times. The VLGA is very pleased to be collaborating with LG Pro to bring this program to you, and we look forward to many more such collaborations. As an independent organisation supporting councillors and councils in good governance, the VLGA provides opportunities for networking, professional development and information exchange, and we actively engage with key policymakers and broader stakeholders to inform, influence and lead the conversations that determine the priorities for the local government sector in Victoria. All councillors and staff at a VLGA member council are able to access our programs and services, and we welcome a diverse range of participants in the audience today. Thank you to Jenny and Tony for leading this discussion. Today's conversation may take us many places. From the VLGA's perspective, we hope that the conversation may lead us to examine that small space between what is compliance with the minimum required standards and that point beyond where we as leaders and elected representatives choose a course of action based on the principles of integrity, ethics and transparency. A wise person once said, if you can find two reasons why you should not do something, even if you can identify two reasons why you should, then perhaps it's best not to proceed. It's this grey area that often leads to questions about probity and process. Yes, we may well have met the minimum required standard, but what does the action look like to outsiders and does it pass the sniff test? So I hope today's conversation takes us across many of those areas and I will now like to hand back to my colleague and co-host, Chris Eddy. Thank you, Catherine. If our preliminary discussions are anything to go by, yes, it could go in any which way this uh, conversation today. But I think the important thing is we want it to go in the direction that the audience takes it. This is your opportunity to ask questions and explore issues, um, things that perhaps are already exercising your mind as we move into this important period on the, uh, the calendar in terms of the electoral cycle. I would like to more formally introduce our panel members now, and we are delighted to have with us Jennifer Menzies, who is the Principal Research Fellow at the Policy Innovation Hub of Griffith University, a published author on caretaker conventions. Uh, you might have come across Jenny's book, which I think is subtitled, Who's Minding the Shop for Government, while you're in this uh, caretaker period. So we're gonna get some insights from Jenny on how caretaker conventions have evolved over time in Australia particularly. And Tony Raunich is joining us, Managing Principal from Hunt and Hunt Lawyers. Uh, Tony's joined us on a few panels in recent times and we always appreciate his insights. Tony is also a former councillor and mayor, so has that council law experience to draw on as well. And I don't think we're supposed to talk about his potential uh, football career that didn't quite get there. But uh, Tony, Charlie Pride, one of the biggest selling recording artists in the world was almost a baseball player as well. I'll just point that out. So uh, thanks all and uh, welcome. I'm wearing two hats today as the interim CEO of LG Pro, and it is uh, a pleasure for us to be partnering with the VLGA on um, initiatives like this to get to as many people across the sector as we can to help 
with uh, that problem solving that you might be needing to do. So let's get started and welcome to all of you. We've got uh, well over 100 people uh, joining us today, some of whom will watch it back. We understand that's a big part of the uh, um, uh, the, the process these days, being able to watch these as, uh, as you see fit. Um, but welcome from councils right across uh, Victoria. Jenny, can I start with you um, to, to get the ball rolling? So tell us a bit about the work that you've done over time in understanding caretaker conventions. How did this come about as an interest for you? Oh, it's very sad if that's your interest, really, isn't it? Um, it just came about because ANU Press actually, and through Ansel, commissioned a monograph for, because for some reason in Australia, no one had ever really looked at caretaker conventions, uh, done some proper academic research and analysis across jurisdictions. So uh, myself and Anne Tiernan uh, got that job and have been kind of, you know, the caretaker convention people since then. So you've, you've published books on this. So perhaps if you could give us a little bit of the, uh, the context, I guess, of how Caretaker came to be a thing. It goes back to Westminster, am I right? It is. It's one of those, uh, it's, you see it in Westminster democracy. So it's the classic thing where you have normally a constitution, which is the formal written uh, rules of the government and how it should operate. And then there's a whole range of practices and methods of operation not in the constitution. So to cover them off, you develop a convention around, well, how do you operate in that situation? So, so for state and federal governments, for example, cabinet is not mentioned in the constitution. It's a convention that if you form a government, you form a cabinet within that government. So stuff that we think is kind of, normalised, a lot of it is just through that reciprocal agreement that this is how we're going to manage the business of government. So um, you've looked at how these conventions have evolved over time across Australia. Do you have any observations on um, how these have come about for local government? It, 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 and is it a different consideration to uh, other levels of government, in your view? And yeah, there are some changes. So the, the caretaker conventions are a subset of the conventions around the accountability of the elected government to the parliament or the chamber and the understanding that the opposition is, an, is a government in waiting. Um, so they're designed to moderate the substantial advantages of incumbency by constraining the power of the political executive. Uh, in Australia, they were first documented in 1957 when Sir Robert Menzies wrote to his uh, came with colleagues and said, look, we're going into government, um, please, you know, respect the caretaker conventions. Um, and then, so from that simple letter, they've evolved into these very kind of detailed guidances and codes of conduct that you'd be familiar with. Um, so local government was a bit of a late comer. Victoria, as you're probably aware, was the leader of that in 2003 uh, when it introduced uh, caretaker conventions into your local government act. And I think Queensland was the next cab off the rank in 2007. Where it's a bit tricky for local government is one of the characteristics of a convention is they're not subject to uh, judicial interpretation or enforceable through the legal system. So if you're a state premier or you're a prime minister and you do something that is obviously against the caretaker conventions during an election, no one can take you to court. So the sanctions are kind of moral and political where people can go, well, that's kind of outrageous. Um, but in our research we did in our book, um, now that it's embedded within local government acts, it does make it uh, legally enforceable. So local government, in a way, the stakes are, are much higher mm -hmm. if you're not adhering to the caretaker conventions because there are penalties uh, within that act if you don't. Mm. That's really interesting. Um, so in terms of, uh, we'll get to Tony in a moment, how it's changed since it came into Victoria, because it has changed a bit along the way. Is it still changing at the federal and state level, Jenny, or has that been pretty much set in place now for some time? I, th I think the principles are stable. What changes, and this is where the bureaucracy has kind of taken over, uh, are the, the codes that come out before every election. So. Um, for example, 
with the introduction of social media and the internet, suddenly in the caretaker convention uh, guidances, there's chunks and chunks now on how you manage your social media, how you manage the internet so that you're not giving kind of political advantage to the incumbency. So the those kind of, they evolve in that the practices are updated. And what you find um, is say, a, a cabinet minister or politician does something really terrible uh, during the caretaker period in the backwash. It's the bureaucrats who now seem to then go, all right, we're gonna make sure that doesn't happen again. And it's put in the guidance for the next election. So they're getting larger and larger with more and more detail. So I would think after like the recent sports sports uh, stuff in Canberra, you would think that the Prime Minister and Cabinet's next election guidance will have a lot of information about grains, I would think. The reason I ask that, well, uh, interesting observation that it's perhaps more legally enforceable at the local level than at other levels, because we often have this conversation about local government being subject to a higher standard, if you like, than, than the other <laughs> levels of government expect of themselves. I, I don't expect you to comment on that unless you unless you want to. Um, just an interesting observation. I might bring uh, Tony into it. Tony, welcome. Great to see you again. Um, these caretaker conventions, now, now known as the election period in Victoria, have evolved quite dramatically in Victoria over the 17 years they've been in, haven't they? That's right, Chris. And in, in fact, um, when they were first brought in in 2003, the, the, the uh, caretaker period, as it was called then, was was substantially longer than the current 32-day period. It was 57 days. Um, that was uh, reduced in 2008. I think really the impetus for that reduction in the time period was that it was felt that 57 days was too constraining on council operations, was impeding the ability of you know, lo local democracy to function for too long a period. Yeah. And we, we've since 2008, we've had this consistent 32 day election period as it's referred to in the current legislation. I do remember when it first came in the very first time, things pretty much ground to a halt because, you know, councils really were, it was new, um, didn't really know uh, what they should or shouldn't be doing uh, and didn't want to run afoul of it. It's become more workable, I guess you'd agree. Yeah, but that's, I think it's, it's evolved. And I think the introduction of uh, election period policies at a local level at each municipality has, has helped that and, and allowed municipalities to consider just how um, they would continue to, to, to function um, during that election period. I think probably the main difference with uh, between local governments and the parliaments is the ability of councils to still um, meet uh, and some councils choose to still have meetings during that uh, election period whereas the parliaments you know once they're prorogued um, you know they're, they're, they're not they don't function um, once uh, you know the um, the elections called I think perhaps the rationale there is that you know the federal and state, parliaments have these big government departments and department heads and they've got all these resources that can continue the function of government whereas councils are a little more constrained but it does pose some real um, you know, risks or, or issues for councils in terms of how they function during that election period where perhaps they're able to have meetings in certain circumstances. That issue Tony just raised about whether councils should be meeting at all during the election period, I'm, I'm keen to explore a bit and some of our audience members may have some observations. Keen to know how many councils have decided, perhaps under the election period policy, that they won't meet um, and what sort of issues that's raising. So perhaps if I can throw an example out there, Tony, we've had an announcement this week of um, COVID related funding that rurals and regionals in particularly will be probably needing to make some decisions about. Um, is it appropriate that councils should be meeting to make decisions around those sorts of issues on the, uh, at the 11th hour of an election campaign? Well, well that's the, the million dollar question, isn't it? And there are certainly um, arguments for and against. So one of the challenges of, of having a, a, a public council meeting um, 
during an election period is that I guess it just takes one councillor to grandstand an election year to bring the whole thing into disrepute and put pressure on the other councillor candidates to, um, to respond in kind. So um, often we'll have um, where councils do still meet during the election period, they will have uh, a different framework of rules. So they might have um, notices of motion suspended, so make it more difficult for councillors to sort of um, create a platform for themselves by, um, you know, posing controversial notices. Um, there may be a suspension of the audio and video recording of um, the meetings. There may be no um, public questions from uh, on public questions from questions from the gallery. That process might be suspended during the election period as well. All aimed at really um, removing this element of um, campaigning and electioneering during um, you know the the thirty two day period. Catherine, I've lost you off my screen, so I just want to t check in and see whether we have some questions coming in because I think that issue I just raised might already be subject to some questioning in the in the chat room. Uh, it is. Thank you, Chris. Uh, we have a question here from Cathy. I'm not sure if you'd like to talk to it, Cathy, but essentially it is in regard to how councils might manage, uh, you know, community conversations around planned COVID related stimulus packages promised by the government. Hello. Um, thank you, Chris and Catherine and everyone. Um, yes, we, we were talking about this this morning in a management meeting around um, we're getting these stimulus packages um, started to come or starting to be promised, which will need some consultation with the community yet we're not supposed to initiate new consultation. Um, we're sort of taking the view that um, because the um, government are you know providing it and directing it that it's okay but how do we really manage that? Jenny is there any experience that you can draw on from other jurisdictions in relation to these types of issues? Well there is uh, capacity within the caretaker conventions to um, take decisions within a crisis and that you know obviously governments need to be able to continue if there's a flood or a terrorist event or something like that um, and the principle behind that is then you make sure you have a bipartisan agreement. So because the opposition seen a as a government in waiting, they then become more part of the decision making process. And, and, you, and if they agree with the way forward, then that's fine to do. It's a bit different in local government when it's not a, a partisan environment, and it's more community members, but there is probably something around con consensus. So I, I, I think you wouldn't go forward if it was controversial because that's mm. binding an incoming, you know, uh, council into a decision. And I also thought there was the capacity um, to get an exemption to make a decision if you had to because of an emergent or urgent event through the local government minister. And I'm not sure if many people kind of would go down that path, but that also exists as well. We do okay. have another question. This one's from Rosemary Scott. Um, Rosemary, I'm not sure if you'd like to talk to it directly. It is a long question. Um, it wasn't so much a question, just um, something we're grappling with at the moment. Just curious to, to see other thoughts on. So one big one we've got is roadworks. We're needing to tell people about that. Um, roads is our number one election issue. So as soon as we go out, particularly on our social media platforms, we've got a real challenge there. Um, but the operational need to tell people sort of overrides that. So I was really just doing a bit of a litmus test on that one. Oh. Um, and then secondly, and, and I think it was kind of covered off in that question just before around floods and storms, et cetera, that, you know, we might not actually be able to certify to get out um, in the middle of the night. Um, but I think that, you know, again, that operational emergency need probably overrides that if we needed to defend that in court at some point. So, <laughs> um, and then the third one was just around certifying live streams, if anyone's got any um, ways they've actually worked out to do that, because um, you can't have pre-prepared content. So. <laughs> So just expand on that one a little bit, Rosemary, the live stream. Live streaming. So, for example, Library yeah. Storytime, and that one's a bit easier because we know it'll be a particular book that's read. Um, leisure classes where they might get somewhat conversational in the middle of the class as, um, you know, they're 
ad-libbing. Um, obviously, they wouldn't recklessly be um, putting um, election material out there at that point, but they might accidentally do it. Um, so, yeah, that one's probably a challenge. You know, it could even come down to something like song choice that gets misinterpreted um, uh, somehow. So, yeah, but also how do you physically certify a live stream? Um, which we haven't got any answers to, and I haven't come across many in our networks that have as yet. I'd be interested to throw that one then out to the Brains Trust that we have in the room, whether anyone's uh, considered that issue or had advice on that issue. Um, anyone has any thoughts on that, please, uh, please let us know. Catherine, how are the uh, comments and questions coming? Uh, perhaps, Chris, um, we might go to the audience and, and see if there are some questions particularly in regard to the caretaker conventions um, uh, as they relate to even matters that might be at front of mind for, for counsellors or candidates. Uh, and while people are thinking about those questions, I wonder if, uh, if Steve Cooper's with us from the VLGA and uh, known to many as co-host of the weekly governance update. Hi, Steve. Hate to, hate to put you on the spot, but while we're waiting for... Uh, for Tony to come back on. Um, I, I know you've looked at some election period policies and I wonder whether you could touch on some of the elements that would normally be happening as part of council meetings that are being put in abeyance in terms of good practice, I guess, during election policies. I know we've talked on the governance update about things like public question time and notices of motion, et cetera. Do you have some observations perhaps you could share with us on that? I think the challenge, Chris, and just looking at some of the questions that have been asked um, early is just to be um, as clear eyed as possible as to what is the normal business of the council? What is the business that needs to go um, before the meeting at this time compared with, um, and probably I, I would have thought a little rule of thumb is for every reason, if there is any doubt for every reason why an issue should be put before the council to try to find some reasons why some stakeholders might say that things shouldn't go to the council, like because it is a time where the council's under scrutiny and um, and decisions. Um, there may well be decisions that seem quite normal um, if you only consider a narrow band of stakeholders that could subject the councillors to criticism. Jenny, I know your area of expertise is probably not directly related to local government in Victoria, but feel free to chime in on any of these things as we wait for hopefully Tony to return. I'm going to have to call on the Brains Trust in the room for some of these things. So I'm noticing some people are wondering about this, uh, this comment of certifying that Rosemary um, referred to. Does anyone have any observations on the certification requirement. I, I'm assuming this is referring to that issue of the CEO having to certify that material is not electoral material that's published during an election period. Have I got that right? I'm happy to weigh in just while people Definitely. are thinking. Remembering that the, um, the 2020 Act has changed in the sense that the 1989 Act re required material to be certified. Um, that's now been removed and the requirement under the 2020 Act is that electoral material should not be published. Um, so there's a sort of a more of a liability kind of exposure rather than a requirement to certify. Now, the obvious response would be to retain a certification process. And there were some questions around um, certain elements of service, like, um, you know, live streaming, library story times or things like that. And again, the, the question a, there needs to be a process internally, but B, the question is, is it part of the normal business of the organisation? So I'll throw it open to anyone who may have some observations. So I wonder, Blager, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot, I know Nilimbik's considered the certification issue, haven't you? What does your election period policy allow for? Thank you, Chris. I'm happy to discuss it with the group. Um, so when we looked at the policy, we did retain the um, approval. So we, we renamed it to approval process. Um, it's not um, obviously mandated, but we thought um, internally from an integrity and sort of oversight perspective, it'd be good to have um, sort of a lens over what was being published. Um, and it, you know, from a risk perspective, it reduces that element of risk um, that we're doing something wrong. Because uh, there's still a requirement, obviously, to not um, publish material that um, could be considered electioneering. So um, we need to retain that approval process. 
Thanks, Blaga. That's really useful. Catherine, I, I can see comments coming in the chat and they're going a bit fast for me. You might have had a chance to review them. I think yes. we might be getting a bit of a straw poll there on the certification issue. We are. We certainly are, Chris. There's a lot of questions and comments about certification. A number of councils have retained uh, the process. Um, I'm not sure if, if any of those councils would like to talk to that as well, but, but it certainly seems to be something that although the requirements have changed, councils are still retaining um, some sort of process like that. And not necessarily imposing that responsibility on the CEO from what I can see, it's been yeah, devolved or delegated um, to some lower levels. Yes, exactly. Jenny, if I can come back to you, I'm wondering about your observations on these sorts of issues and, and more about you know, local government in other states. I know you've looked at how Queensland followed Victoria's leave, et, et, et cetera. Has the, has the evolving of the caretaker conventions in other states in terms of local government mirrored what's happened in Victoria? Uh, because Victoria was the first mover on this, I haven't looked at them, I must say, for a couple of years, but last time I looked, they all pretty much replicated uh, Victoria, so congratulations to you. Mm. Um, I think there's a few issues that I kind of thought of as the discussion went through there. I mean, it's important to remember one of the key principles of caretaker is the business of government continues and ordinary matters of administration proceed. Um, so I think as Tony said, look, like with state and federal governments, you have those large departments and, you know, 90% of stuff continues. And to a certain extent, uh, that would happen in local government as well. Um, with some of this kind of decision making and the issues that people have been have brought up. Um, the thing with conventions is a lot of it's based on precedent and judgment um, and the context of the circumstances at the, at the time. And I think this is why uh, the, the guidances keep getting updated and larger and larger. It's, it's, it's really people's uh, professional um, understanding and judgment um, that allows them to look at an issue as it comes in, look at the context of what's happening. And it's because of the COVID situation this year, we are in a slightly um, different context. So I think there will be some issues such as those allocation of those grants or the consultation that haven't been faced before. But if you keep going back, I always think to the basic principles and use that as the basis for your judgment. In terms of use of um, resources during the election period that's coming up, what are councillors finding in terms of challenges? I know we've we've heard in the past about mobile phones and business cards and even the use of the councillor title, etc. If there's any councillors with us that could share some observations on how you're approaching this upcoming period, probably a nice context would be um, how council, what councillors, and maybe even CEOs and governance officers, that risk of using the resources of the council for election purposes, and what the line might look like as to what's okay and what's not okay. Noticing, noting that if you get close to the line, uh, maybe it's not okay. Um, so I'd be interested in comments on that, Chris. Councillor Denise Masu, do you have a comment there? Yeah, I was just going to say, Chris, um, in terms of using the title, we've been advised that we're still councillors until um, 6am on the 24th, I believe, yep. and um, that we can use the, the title councillor. Um, I guess the other thing, though, is with social media is not to perhaps have your election or the Facebook page that you're using in your election um, is best to be separated if you've got one that you use for your normal council business. Um, and in terms of using officers or I think approaching officers to get information that might support your pitch in the election, that's not allowed. Okay. Uh, I know at Whitehorse that wouldn't be tolerated. They'd be saying, no, no. We can't give you advantage to information that other um, candidates couldn't um, have access to, perhaps, yes. so easily. So, yeah. So, in your view, Denise, is it clear what you can and can't do, or are there any grey areas that still challenge you as a current councillor? Um, look, I feel pretty clear about it. I. Think I should know my community. I mean, I'm sitting councillor, so 
I believe I know the community well enough and I know enough about Whitehorse that I don't need to go and approach the officers to try and get any additional information. Um, and I think for people who are not incumbents, they do actually still have access to it because most things are on the website. And if they want to go through and find the different things that have been on agendas and how voting's been and what the decisions were and all the policies and strategies, et cetera, are there. So I think um, probably you don't have that much of an advantage other than perhaps it's more front of mind because you're in the role, but it is accessible to everybody. Really, most of it's there. One of the uh, issues actually that Tony raised when, when he was online with us was the matter of councils meeting during the, the caretaker period and perhaps that's worthy of some further exploration. We do have a question here from Michelle Kane, um, which talks to um, the fact that a council meeting at, at their council has been scheduled um, in the middle of caretaker and that um, appears to be the mayor would like to do a presentation about her time on council after, as it will be her last meeting um, after years on council. But I guess rather than perhaps go into any um, assessment of, of, of that council's particular process, a general conversation around some of the reasons why a council might need to meet. And I guess we could reflect back also on those early COVID days when councils in Victoria didn't have the ability to meet virtually and were unable to come together. There was certainly some processes that councils needed to call on in terms of delegated authorities to allow the council to continue to operate during that time. So I'd be really um, interested to see um, what the people in the room thoughts are on this. And Jenny, you have a comment on that? I just do have a comment because with, within the state jurisdictions and the federal government, um, cabinet doesn't meet, there's no executive council, so there is no formal decision making processes. Um, so that just takes that out of the arena. And, and I can't think that the business before uh, local council would be more urgent than the business before state and federal governments. And an, another issue is the research that Anne and I did into fixed four-year terms really diminishes the need to have those kind of meetings because you've got such a long run-up to get the, get the decisions through the council that you need to do in a timely manner. Um, I, I, I think that there's kind of... I, I can't see a great lot of need for the council to actually meet during the caretaker time. So in other words, fixed terms allows you to plan. You shouldn't have anything other than maybe some sort of emergency um, to deal with during that, that period. You should be able to plan to not meet. So whether that's agreed across the board, I noticed um, some people talking about meeting to consider annual reports, et cetera. Perhaps we'll come, come back to that. But the issue that Catherine raised on behalf of someone else about a and you might have a view on this, Jenny, about a, a mayor or a councillor who is not standing for re-election, using a council meeting in the election period to talk about their legacy. Is that appropriate, given they're not running? Um, Sorry, we missed the first part of that, Jenny. I said I'm not sure if I, I want to go there. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. It's a tricky one. What, it's a tricky one. What do, others, what do others think about that? Anyone have a view? Chris, while others are raising their hand, there's a sort of a cultural issue in terms of supporting the council to, um, I think, constantly remind any councillors who are not re-standing that um, the provisions of the caretaker policy or the election period policy still apply to them. Um, now, that's not to weigh into the decision that's confronting Mansfield, but just I was talking as a, as a general rule in sort of reinforcing culture. I think that's an important one. And what about this issue of meeting to um, consider planning applications during the election period? I'm seeing a bit of that coming through the chat. They could potentially be electorally sensitive, Steve, do you think? I know of at least one council, Chris, where in their election period policy, it quite clearly specifies that the council can meet to consider um, planning applications where a failure to do so might expose them to an appeal on the basis of failure to make a decision. But a lot of the election period policies that I've seen are silent on that point. 
Blaga, I'll come to you in a sec. I, I can see Michael Tudbull on my screen. I hope you don't mind, Michael. It would be really good to get a current CEO view on some of this stuff. And I saw you nodding about some of what we were just talking about there. What's challenging you, if anything, at the moment as a CEO, Michael? Uh, local government elections. <laughs> <laughs> Aside from that. <laughs> um, so I was going to comment on a couple of things, Chris, just what, uh, what we're doing. And we've taken the decision here to hold an October council meeting. Um, th there's actually a, a tender that's going to go as, as well. Um, it's under the, the limit, so it's within the rules. We've had a, a briefing with the council. And um, I, I think to Steve's point earlier about the normal business, and I think Jenny's as well, the normal business of council. Well, it is the normal business. They're not committing a future council to a big policy decision. It's not a huge change of budget. It's a budgeted item that they've previously resolved on. It's going through a, a process. The annual report, uh, the very important Christmas closure of the offices uh, is going up uh, to October as well. So um, we, we've taken the decision, and it's a virtual meeting, of course, so we're not... Um, uh, we're not sitting in the same room. So we've taken the decision to continue. Um, on the issue of um, not re-standing councillors, we will definitely have two. Um, and I just spoke to the mayor about it last night, about them getting an opportunity. Now we do recognise at the statutory meeting, and that'll be interesting to see how that ends up happening in November. Hopefully it's in person, but whatever. We recognise councillors who weren't re-elected or didn't re-stand. Uh, but what we're going to do at the October meeting is give the opportunity in the councillor reports. So we have a, a section at the end. We don't have general business, thank God, uh, or any of those types of things. But we do have councillors just giving a wrap of their week or whatever. And the two councillors are going to give a wrap of their four years and 10 years, respectively, in, in, that, um, in that time. So uh, we think that's quite appropriate. Um, the community would expect it. And we don't see any issue as far as the caretaker election conventions um, with that. B besides that, um, we're also, we're certifying. So I know our governance coordinator, Carly, is on in our new governance rules. We kept it up um, just for that internal control, I guess, just to make sure that we didn't slip up anywhere. It's still me, but it's all electronic. So it's, um, it's relatively straightforward. And you know, we have things like PAC advertisements of shows coming up, which there aren't many, of course, and, and those, those general run of the mill things. So I get to see them. We've just asked the guys to live it as best they can so they're not flooding me with it. So th that's just a few things from us, Chris. Yeah, good observations, Michael. Do you have a public question time or a notice of motion um, section of your meeting that's either continuing during election period or put in abeyance? Uh, so, so we're not putting it in abeyance. So we have um, we have three ways that you can um, interact with council: deputation, public question, uh, or a petition. Um, they're they're still open to the community um, at this point in time. Uh, uh, we don't have uh, the public question time is, is is basically a question on notice. It's got to be by midday um, of the day of the council meeting to prepare a response. And generally, it's just um, uh, read out by the CEO and answered by the CEO um, or, or appropriate officer. So we'll we'll keep that up. We think we had our first virtual attendee. Um, we don't get many to our council meetings, so uh, I think the the record I've had in person at uh, Southern Grants has been about twelve for a planning application. No surprise. Online, we get about seventy. Um, so so it's been a great. Uh, boom for the community to be able to access and we had actually someone come into the meeting and give a deputation at the last council meeting so so that was pretty good i doubt we'll have that in caretaker because there's really nothing unless someone's going to complain about the office closure there's probably not much else to, to worry about yes all right thank you michael catherine uh, i think jenny had her hand up um and we might go to jenny and then also um blagger blagger right. you had your hand up i noticed I just had a further, further thought about councillors who aren't standing, who want to make some kind of valedictory speech. Yeah. Um, again, I don't see within a kind of fixed four year term why that can't be done at the last meeting before caretaker, which is what happens in parliaments. At the, it's usually the last sitting day of the year and all the members who aren't contesting their seats get their moment to do a, a valedictory thing. So, so I think it might be worthwhile thinking about that as a process that could be adopted. And, and Blaga, you had your hand up. Um, a few things have come up since I've, I've had my hand up and, and yeah. I would, I'll, I'll try to contain my responses to, it, originally um, I think Steve indicated that some of the policies that he's seen online in relation to 
um, council election, uh, sorry, council meetings um, and why you would call a meeting during um, election period. And we're one of those councils where we um, won't be holding any meetings during the election period. But we have indicated that um, should the Planning and Environment Act um, require um, a decision to be made within the, the statutory time frame, um, a councillor can call in a matter and, and we could call an extraordinary meeting under the governance rules. Mm -hmm. um, so just wanted to make that point um, on that matter. Um, I also wanted to just um, raise the point that Jenny and, and Catherine and even Michael just raised about councillors that are not recontesting. So we had our final council meeting last night um, and a councillor who has declared that they're not recontesting the seat um, did um, provide um, a speech in relation to their time um, and was really well, um, I think, um, constructed, um, you know, and, and thanked the whole council. It, there wasn't any sort of electioning type of, um, you know, context in it. Um, I think it was really well measured. Um, and what we ended up doing also prior to the last meeting, um, the CEO um, just sent out an email to all the councillors, just reminding them, you know, we're out of caretaker, but, you know, we're very close to it. Perception is, um, is um, stronger than sometimes policy um, and just, you know, to bear in mind with, you know, some of the rules that are um, around electioneering um, and that, you know, risk associated with, you know, um, sort of stepping the line over that line. So um, there's not much more we could do in that regard, but I think they're really well behaved considering. So Thanks, Blaga. That's really useful. Catherine, how is the conversation in the chat going? There are a couple of questions, but I did know Steve had his hand up when Blaga was talking. So, Steve, okay. over to you. Uh, thanks, Catherine. Can I just pick up on a comment that Michael made? We'll just tag team with each other, Michael. Um, and it was a really important one around the, um, the reports going to council. And I really like that example of the, of the contract, of the tender, and the importance of really curating reports to make sure that it's boiled back down to the issue at hand, which is, as Michael described, to award a contract a contract for work that had already been determined. You know, so it's not a time in council reports to extol the merits of the project. It really needs to be boiled back down if the council has to make a decision um, to the issue at hand. Thank you, Steve. We have a question here from Sarah, which we might throw to the room, and that is, how many, uh, um, are many councils keeping a register of information requests from councillors and candidates during the election period? Good question. Anyone have some examples of that? That's been around for a while, hasn't it, to try and manage that sharing of information? I see some people saying yes in the chat. Steve, have you picked that up in election period policies, for example? Chris, I think you'd find it would be just in, in the overwhelming majority of um, election period policies that a process such as that needs to be there. And I would have presumed for most people in this session um, the notion of the register itself is um, quite a simple one. The devil's in the detail in terms of a um, capturing candidates when they've got questions and making sure the process effectively works with election related questions that are sent out to everyone. And maybe people in the room will have some issues around that detail of how do you actually know when it's a candidate asking the organisation a question and how you've actually managed that. Catherine, are there any outstanding issues at this point? Look, not that I can see. We have quite a few people um, answering Sarah's question about the keeping of registers. So Sarah, check out the chat function and you'll, you'll get um, some good feedback there. I'll come back to Jenny. So uh, there's a couple of questions around um, use of imagery, I guess, uh, during the election period. So a mayor who has the ability to put on the mayoral robes for a photo opportunity or wear a, you know, a mayoral chain or a jewel of office or, or something. Um, I think someone's been asking about the appropriateness of that. Have you come across examples of that in your research, Jenny? It's incumbency, isn't it? And even though the caretaker conventions are designed to kind of even the playing field, obviously the city incumbent has that, uh, that advantage of being in the position and being able to t talk with that kind of authority about being in the position. So there's really, there's nothing against it and you see it with all political leaders mm. um, during elections so uh, Queensland state elections coming up in October and I'm sure the Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk will be using that power of incumbency to be doing a whole lot of COVID related stuff mm -hmm. um, it's it's the nature of the game so it's a more of an even playing field not entirely an even playing field 
So Jenny, where do you see all this going in terms of the further evolving of, of caretaker conventions? Has it gone as far as it, it ever will, do you think? Or is there more, are there more examples coming from perhaps even outside of Australia to suggest where we might end up here? Well, what our research has shown us is there's actually, because the conventions are actually meant to be kind of adhered to and maintained by the um, elected politicians. But our research has shown that they've actually been taken over by the bureaucracy as a buffer against political in interference. So it's something that people haven't kind of picked up that... Um, it's the, it's the bureaucrats who have more of an, a vested interest in having the detailed guidelines and the guidances about what is acceptable behaviour and what isn't, because it gives them something to refer back to if they're asked to do uh, something that they think is kind of not in the spirit of the caretaker. Mm. Um, I think the issue with local government is the one about it being uh, legally binding and enforceable and I and Tony would know this but I I don't know if anyone actually has been taken um, charged with an offence under the Victorian Local Government Act about a breach of caretaker but in, in our book we flagged that as a potential trend um, and something to keep an eye on so I'm not sure what if, if anyone has any examples of something I suspect not I, I suspect the penalties are there but they haven't been enforced as yet yeah um, thank you, Jenny. I, I, I noticed a question that's come through from Blaga, who was speaking earlier about um, events during the election period and whether um, they should be promoted during this time. Does anyone have any views on that? Or it'd be interesting to get a sense from the room on how councils are handing, handling the running of events. I imagine that under a COVID environment they're few and far between although of course with regional victoria starting to open up there might be some potential for that to happen hello hello everyone uh, look at strathbogie we kept it really simple uh no council events and no promotion at all so we we needed to keep it really really simple any other thoughts um Blager, are you aware of any events happening is that why you're asking the question yeah so our, our policy refers to um an annual um, event that is shy wide uh, that would happen ordinarily regardless of whether we're in caretaker or not um, and those events um, we've indicated will continue um, obviously with strict um, approval process for anything that may happen um, you know as a result of promoting those events but also that um, you know the mayor and, and councillors don't have any official um, you know capacity in those events they can attend them but um, and that's all there is um, so it was just interesting to hear because there are other um, parts of the organisation that are coming through the traps, you know, saying, well, why can't we hold an event? It doesn't have any sort of political um, elements to it. It's very, it's, it's relating to operational matters. Um, you know, it's promoting environment or it's promoting, you know, health and wellbeing, those types of things. So I'd mm. be keen to hear what others think in terms of um, how they're, you know, dealing with those matters. Andrew Dowling's got his hand up. Andrew, far away. Yeah, thanks for that, Chris. Um, we, we get this question a lot across the organisation and we made a clear distinction in our policy to try and talk about civic and ceremonial events. Um, so clearly we're not having celebratory or, uh, events, we're not having um, those sorts of you know, opening functions and that sort of stuff. Um, but the business of council goes on and I suppose that's the challenge. So. Um, whilst Knox currently doesn't have a, a, a library that sits under our umbrella in times past in previous roles, you know, we would always talk about library story time. This is not an event that we should be shutting down during caretaker period um, because it's really got nothing to do with its business as usual. We're doing particularly at the moment, a lot of seminars and work um, around COVID. So there's um, mental health workshops to help clubs continue and so on. Um, we look at the criteria and the advice I tend to give is, is it going to be controversial um, if it's held? Is it going to be detrimental if it's not? There's not much point putting um, COVID workshops on in December after the caretaker period when people need them now. Um, so we're taking very much a view that it's the business as usual stuff that can continue, but we've got to be careful about promotions. And as Blaga said, no, um, no councillor involvement, typically no celebrating council's achievements. Um, very factual, stick to, the, stick to the nature of the event. Yeah, very sensible. Thank you for that perspective, Andrew. There's something Blaga said that made me 
um, uh, wonder about some of the CEOs in our audience, and Michael, it doesn't have to be you, but you're the only one I can see on uh, with a camera on at the moment. Um, that comment about uh, questions from within the organisation sort of reminds me about the work that a CEO and the executive need to do to uh, to get the message right down into your organisation about what should and shouldn't be done during this period of time. That's not an easy task to get uh, get the message through and have that understanding. And I wonder what sort of tools or um, uh, tips you'd have for getting that message, making sure that message gets through. Any CEOs that uh, have contemplated this? Michael? I'm happy to start, Chris, but I, and I can't see who else is on, but I'm really keen for my colleagues to share as well. <laughs> um, so I'll pump up the tyres of our governance team to start with, and I know Carly's um, on this, uh, this webinar. So um, uh, really early, um, we, we started our work on our governance rules, and it was a lot of the current local law, but um, a, a hell of a lot of work went into it. And I thank um, everyone in the team who did that. But then, then a, a fact sheet and a, a ready reckoner, if you like, on our intranet. Um, we've got a staff Facebook page that we use as well to put out there. And then, of course, contacting um, you know, Carly in the first instance or any of the executive. Spoke about it at the executive meeting, put the, the overall in place, and then spoke about it at the senior leadership team meeting. So to get it at least to the third level in the organisation. And then we have a regular um, uh, a newsletter couldn't think of the word. Uh, it's just gone out this morning. So the exchange, it's got a whole um, election period page uh, within it. Uh, at least it's not a full COVID page these days, although that's grown uh, in regional Victoria now, thankfully, to um, the reopening stuff. But uh, really simple stuff and then on the intranet and, and whatever. So just getting it out there really simply and making it a, a bit like some have already said, um, having it pretty simple. We just don't do X anymore through this period. We can do yeah. Y. Um, and, and that's why with the, um, the certifications, um, you know, we said, because you don't technically need to do it for job adverts, but everything's coming through at the moment just to make it simple for the staff. It's an online form. They fill it out. It comes to me and it goes straight back to them. So I think making it really easy in the messaging, Chris, is that, that the best thing to do for staff. And if you're not sure, um, you've got the central contact point. Good one. Thank you, Michael. I see Jackie Weatherall is with us from Stonington. Lovely to see you, Jackie. Can you add anything Thank to you. that from your perspective? Yeah, look, I think exactly the same as Michael was saying. Um, I've talked to our comms team and we're just now about to release a whole range of information across the organisation. We've been building up to it and I've been talking to the staff even about things like, you know, expecting that there'll be a lot of criticism of council by candidates and things like that and don't don't enter into it. This is a normal part of the process and, um, you know, giving them fact sheets and information and then just over that caretaker period, making sure the comms team, every time that there's some communications, I do a couple of emails a week out to staff about different things, just making sure there's at least one paragraph and, and directing them where to get the information, etc. And if they think it could be contentious, don't do it kind of thing. That's a really good point you raised too, that I can remember it's been around for a long time. The activity that happens perhaps in local media that staff can start to feel a bit confronted by, how do you deal with that? And how do you, um, I guess, um, build that resilience that uh, you're working in a political environment and you need to, that just needs to run off, just run off you. I wonder, whether that's uh, a bigger issue these days with all the social media activity we have. Yeah, I definitely think it is, Chris. Um, certainly, you know, months ago, I started, even when the, new, um, when the new budget came out and bits and pieces, I warned our team. I said, I expect this year will be much more contentious. And suddenly, mm -hmm. rather than having seven submissions, we had 98. And um, so we know these things so it's important that we already predict what we think is likely to happen and it gives staff trust and comfort and shows that integrity around you know we're being upfront with them we're saying what we expect might happen and um, then I always say to them too I have opportunities for lunch and learns with the CEO or they can email me and they can email the executive and we're happy to answer questions. So it's about being open and transparent. Catherine we might need to start wrapping up I wonder if there's any unresolved issues. I think David Ray um, had some things to add to that conversation, David. Great. From Karangamite. David, yeah, hello. Yeah. Thanks, Catherine and Chris. I'd just reiterate um, what the previous 
two CEOs have, have said. I guess the other thing we've also put in place in addition to what's been said is just reminding staff not to provide an opinion on candidates. Mm. I think that's really important is not, don't get involved in the political process. Um, and particularly for new staff who haven't been through a, a local government election before, is really helping to understand the why. Um, that, that's important because at, at the end of the day, we have to work with these new, with new councillors and it does, and it can cause, um, I guess, relationship damage um, as a consequence. Um, but th at the same time, reinforcing the fact this is democracy at play um, and, and we get to see it play out from within the organisation. Um, so we have, a, we have a very unique perspective. Thank you. Thanks, David. And you win the prize for best virtual background today, by the way. I just love that. <laughs> Good on you. Running the National Assets of Corangan Light. Indeed. Thank you. Um, Catherine, before I go back to Jenny, any final thoughts from you? Uh, look, I think um, we've covered most of the questions that have come through the chat today. And I, I really do thank everyone for engaging on the chat function and answering some of those questions before we've had an opportunity to raise them more broadly, um, you know, with, with the audience. I think, Chris, if we ask for one final question from the floor and then we could perhaps wrap up. Okay, if there is anyone who would like to ask uh, questions or make comments, I notice uh, Rosemary seeking some advice on something for policies or guidelines about staff interacting with candidates online. That sounds like a dangerous place to be going. Um, Rosemary, did you want to speak to that perhaps? Yeah, sure. I suppose it might be one that's a little bit more related to rural councils where you are friends with the candidates um, just through your normal um, contacts on Facebook in particular. Um, mm. Their personal profiles, not candidate for profiles, but you know, there's a perception there that that's problematic. Um, I know I've taken some choices in that space and defriended temporarily. Um, but I'm not in a position to provide advice to staff on what they should do. So. And I'm seeing already an example of a policy where staff are advised to unfriend for the yep. duration of the election period. I wonder if Steve Cooper's got any observations on that, whether that's something you've spotted in election period policies through your, I'm sure, very detailed analysis, Steve. <laughs> Not to that level of detail, Chris, but I think also for a lot of organisations that have got social media policies, you'd find some words in there that talk about not engaging in the politics and it's never more important than coming up to the election. Indeed. All right. I'm not seeing any other hands up, Catherine, unless you've spotted one. No, I think we've covered them off. I think we probably should hear from Jenny. Um, Yes, thank you. I would like to throw back to Jenny just for some final comments and particularly around the principles at play here, Jenny, just to remind people why these conventions came into being in the first place. You know, what, what's the takeaway principle message that people should keep at top of mind through this period? Well, I think, I think the thing about caretaker conventions is they're simple on one level and complex on another. So they're simple about the principles which is really, there's no uh, chamber to which you're responsible at that time. Um, so you shouldn't be making decisions and not to, um, you have to remain impartial so that you're not giving benefit to the incumbent administration. But though those principles sound simple, as we've discussed with the many issues that have come up today, they then become very complex in how you apply those principles. And that's where you go back to precedent, context, judgment. And as I said before, I think this council election will be trickier because of the emergent issue of COVID. So context uh, will be more important. You'll have to look at the context of, of uh, decisions that might have to be made about COVID. So it is gonna be a bit more challenging, I think, than, that, than it has been in the past. Thank you, Jenny. And I, I see Tony's back right on the death knell. Tony, the technology hasn't played nicely with you today, obviously. It has been really nasty for me today. I'm sorry, everyone. We seem to have some have had some crash out in the sticks out here in, uh, in Whittlesea, but um, I'm, I'm really sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Perhaps maybe just uh, some parting words of advice for, you know, how governance professionals should be approaching the next few weeks. Look, I, I think your starting point is always your election period policy. Uh, I, think, I think that um, 
there will there is a, a level of scrutiny that, that you face um, in relation to the use of those council resources. And I just caught the end of that conversation around COVID. And I think the challenge for us all now is um, that there's a real impetus to use council resources at the moment to help the recovery and and um, you know a, a a council campaign at the moment to promote the local economy in tandem with the election period um, needs to be handled really carefully. And there are ways that, that those two things can be done. I've recently given advice to a you know a regional council around. Um, Yes, you still can run that campaign about promoting your local restaurants and cafes now, but let's do it under the banner of the local tourism association. Let's not have the council logo up in shining lights in the local newspaper and social media, because that might be seen as favouring the incumbent councillors there, um, even if they're not the spokespersons on that campaign, and they ought not be during election period. Um, just the fact that you've got those um, that council logo out there um, promoting in the community um, this this particular campaign to use local traders, um, it, it, it could be seen to be favouring those incumbents. If there's another way to do it, um, say through the local tourism association, then that's the approach you should take. Good advice, thank you, Tony, and uh, great to have you back, even if it's just for the last couple of minutes. So sorry. Catherine, some final words from you. Well, I guess I, I find myself at the point at which I started and, and that, you know, concept of perception and does it pass the sniff test and how might it look um, to those on the outside, I think are themes that have come through. I really did um, think that issue of resilience was, was really important as well. And I think we could have a whole other conversation about that and the impact of, of this process and the political process and local democracy um, on, on the staff that work in these multi-million dollar service delivery businesses. I'd like to thank Steve for jumping in um, in Tony's absence. I'm just very pleased, Tony, that you are okay. You're a little <laughs> worried that <laughs> something untoward might have happened. Um, I did also just want to let everyone know that Steve Cooper has recently joined the VLGA team and I'm very pleased to have him on board. Um, thank you, Chris, for your excellent moderation of today's session and also for everyone's participation. Um, we got through what is clearly a very complex uh, and at times ambiguous issue and um, I, I think it was a, a very useful discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Tony. And Jenny, in particular, thank you very much as well for your uh, insights today. I wonder what's next for you, Jenny. Is there another book in the works, perhaps? And what's it about, if there is? Well, we're probably due to update caretaking conventions. I think the last edition was 2014. Um, so we might wait until after maybe the next federal election have another look at that. Otherwise, I'm just working on reforming the Federation and trying to make um, National Cabinet a better entity than it is. Oh, terrific. <laughs> Easy task. You do that in your spare time, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. Catherine, we should plug that we are putting together a panel session for late October about the role of the Mayor. And you came up with a great name for the session. Yes, it's the role of Mayor more than just a title. Indeed. Okay. That effect. Uh, so that will be another co-branded uh, panel discussion, uh, I think, in late October, if I can um, remember. But certainly keep an eye October out. October is our target date. Yeah, yes. exactly. So looking forward to that. And in, in the meantime, of course, we'll have our regular VLGA Connect programs and, and LG Pro, of course, have their regular webinars also. Thank you, Jenny and Tony. We really do appreciate your expert um, input into today's discussion. And Jenny, I'd love to have you back at some stage to talk about the Federation, perhaps after the local government elections. <laughs> okay, then. Lovely to see those comments coming through the chat and we hope to see you again on another session very soon. Good afternoon, all. <laughs>